Okay. Well, welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is the 22nd of October 2014 and um, it's getting up to November here. And so one of the things we want to talk about tonight is the National Novel Writing Month, which um, will be happening um, in November, as I think it has happened for several years now. You, uh, people who know better will tell us about it. Um, looks like Henry's joining us, which is great. Um, Karen Fastenpower is here. Karen is also here to talk to us about, we are in day three of the K-12 online conference, and so that's an exciting thing that's going on. And I guess um, behind all of that or in between all that or something is uh, Connected Educators. Um, so it's a very, very busy time. <laughs> so um, uh, so I asked some friends here to uh, to join us and tell us what they've done with uh, the National Novel Writing Month um, in the past. Um, the, you, Sherry um, has... Uh, published about it um, on her blogs and here and there and then on Digital Wiz and Tommy Vito has, has, has as well. Um, why don't we start with um, Harry, you're just jumping in here. Let's check your mic. How are you? Um, I'm okay. I'm not sure if you can hear me or not. We can. Just speak <laughs> toward your mic a little more and you'll be good or speak up or something. Yeah. Okay. Um, my That's connection. Better, yeah. yeah. Is it better? Okay. You're good, yeah. So just introduce yourself if you don't mind. Sure. Welcome. Uh, my name, yeah, thank you. Thank you. My name is Harry Brake. Um, I'm an educator now in um, Mexico City. Um, I was in the public school system at Seaford, and then when I moved to Mexico City, I'm at the American school. And I now um, I was able to get my master's degree in library science from Mansfield University. So now I work in the upper school library. Cool. And uh, say a little bit about is how's it, how's it pronounced? Is it Nano Nano Rimo? Is that uh, how people are saying it? Yeah. So yeah. tell us a little bit about yeah. your interest in Nano Rimo. Okay. Um, I just I always you know, I had a uh, master's I got in English and I was teaching in English as an English teacher for a long time, and so I was interested in a project that would tie a lot of students together. And one of those happens to be the National Novel Writing Month. And so um, basically every month in November, uh, students get together and they their goal is to write 50,000 words in a month. And they get support from the uh, uh, National Novel Writing Month Center. Uh, Chris Beatty uh, is the founder of that. And so we just did a web, we did a web stream last night with him. It was pretty cool. And like he talks about what Nano is and so we have this now forum of uh, students in Mexico City at the school, and we get them to serve as writing mentors for the middle school students. So every day at lunch, like maybe two or three times a week, the upper school students will get together with the middle school students, and they'll listen to their ideas about what they're writing for the novel and give them ideas and things like that. But during the process, you know, everybody gets a little bit out of it. So it's kind of, it's interesting. <laughs> it's fun, though. Yeah. There's a lot to talk to about, about, and that's cool. And how long have you done this? Yeah. Is this like um, third year? Or? This is my uh, one, two, fourth year. Fourth year oh, really? doing NaNoWriMo. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Oh, so we have a lot to learn. Yeah. From you. Great. Thank you for joining us tonight, Karen. You're next on the list. <laughs> Say hello. Sure. Thanks. Hi, I'm I'm Karen, um, and I want to add on to what Harry said about NaNoWriMo. It's not just for students. It actually started as like Good. an adult yeah. sort of project, and that's my. Yeah. Um, my participation in NaNoWriMo has been not with students, but as an adult person, and I'm just I'm blown away and just amazed by everybody who does this with students. And I just always think about how much of a difference it might have made to me if I would have done this as a student, and still until waiting till I was in my 40s. But um, I love NaNoWriMo. I think it's a really exciting project, and I'm happy to be here tonight. And you're also going to represent a little bit, or I hope, um, K-12 online conference as well. You're one of the conveners and been very busy there. Do you want to say a little more about that already? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the K-12 online conference, um, I'm one of the committee members, and it is a completely non-commercial all volunteer driven um, free online open licensed um, conference and all the sessions are 
asynchronous, so new sessions get posted every day during the two weeks of the conference, which we're on day three in the first week. Um, but people can watch the sessions anytime they want, and people can also reuse them. So you could download the videos and use them for District PD or for kind of anything you want to use them for, remix them, do whatever you want. And we have um, our theme this year is igniting innovation, and we have four um, conference strands, um, Stories for Learning, Games and Gamification, um, Passion Driven Learning, which is the strand that I'm convening and Paul is presenting as a part of, among many other people, and the fourth strand is STEAM. And so lots of good stuff there. Yep, yeah. and so maybe we can get into that a little bit too as well. Thank you for representing both things here tonight, <laughs> as you do so often. Anyway, <laughs> Sherry Edwards, welcome. Hi, I'm a middle school educator in a very rural area of North Central Washington State. And my usually it's my eighth graders that participate in NaNoWriMo, but we are getting smaller in our school population. So we combine seventh and eighth grades. So the seventh graders also get to participate this year. And I started in 2011, so this will be my fourth year. So wow. it's pretty exciting. The kids are so, pretty excited about have you it. You've done it yourself as well with them, or how do you? How yes, do you it, with, yeah. with uh, a young writers project, teachers only have to do thirty thousand words. They started that last year. I'm kind of excited yeah, about that yeah. because <laughs> I had to do it at night. <laughs> it was pretty hard, but I've usually, I think, last year I did fifty thousand again. So. Okay. Right along, kids. Yeah, I did the 50,000, whatever. <laughs> nice, that's cool. <laughs> anyway, Tommy, um, introduce yourself and make your connections clear here, if you don't mind. Okay. Welcome. Uh, my name is Tommy Buteau, and uh, last year I participated uh, with high school seniors uh, in Windsor, Colorado in NaNoWriMo, and uh, we did it a little bit differently. Uh, we were on a block schedule, so we only met about five or six times um, in November because we had a week cut off for Thanksgiving, and so I didn't uh, try to have students write 50,000 words each, uh, you know, in five classes. Um, instead, what we did is we entered as a class and we wrote a book together where each student did one chapter and uh, uh, did it in their own uh, voice or their own character's voice and all of the stories were related to a central event and so the, all of the stories were connected um, and it turned out to be a great project the students really got into it um, and so I'd, I'd love to do it again um, and I'm excited to meet everybody else that's been doing NaNoWriMo because um, you know I'm always surprised whenever I uh, watch uh, teachers teaching teachers or talk to Paul how many people he knows that are doing different things I had no idea that teachers were uh, doing NaNoWriMo with students, so it's great to meet everybody that's uh, done it before, and, and uh, I look forward to hearing everybody's story. And you published um, a, a few times about it, or I think... Or, yeah, when um, I wrote about it uh, on Digital Is, uh, just, uh, I just put it up about a week or two ago, okay. um, just kind of... Uh, recounting what I did last year with my students um, in the hopes that some other people will uh, latch on to the idea and go for it. So, so can, can I um, broaden the conversation a little bit um, I, and ask you what drew you to NaNoWriMo? Like what, uh, what do you do with your students that uh, made this you know, project appeal? Like, what's your approach with kids that makes this fit? Anybody can well, jump in on that. Yeah. Uh, I'll jump in. Uh, for yeah. me, I was just looking for. Um, well, it was my. I've done creative writing classes before that were one semester long. Okay, just a second. Let me. That's okay. Uh, Anybody else want to jump in while Tommy's taking care of that? <laughs> Go ahead. You can introduce to if you want, if you don't mind. Okay. Say hi. I'll jump in. I um, okay. Go ahead, started Jack. with a friend, a friend, Nano uh, Denise Krebs, who was doing it with her seventh grade class. And 
she was an online Twitter blogging friend. And so I kind of got into it and read about it and thought, well, yeah, I need to do this with my students because, you know, most writing classes now are, you know, the five paragraph essay. And I just, as a person who loves writing, I knew there was more to writing than that. And so I really latched on to this idea that students could set their own word count goals so it could meet, you know, who those students who write really slowly or type slowly, you know, they can still be able to participate. And that first year that I did it, it was my first time trying to attempt something as long as this novel. And I was just blown away by what happened. I created a world. And I started with no plot, just a character talking, walking, picking lilacs and looking up and saw a gargoyle wink at her. That was it. And from then on everything just flowed. And I had no idea that you that in our minds and in our brains was this imagination that could just blossom and come out. And I want my students to feel that yes, we're using the curriculum, we're thinking about plot, we're thinking about conflict, we're developing characters, we're thinking about all that right now. And we're also listening to the a global read aloud. And so when we're talking about conflict for our own stories, we're comparing it to the novel that we're reading so that they have fresh in their minds what that means. But when they start writing, the first thing I'm going to say is, what you have planned may not be what your characters decide to do. And really encourage them to, to get that feeling, what it feels like to be a writer where you're just creating your own world. It was, it was just a very freeing and an amazing experience. Cool. Harry, do you want to address that, that question of like how this fits your other approaches, your g just general attitude for teaching and learning and I guess librarianship? Can he hear me? Hello, Harry? Looks like he can't hear he might, he might be off. I could jump yeah. back in. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Tom. Uh, sorry, my daughter is always interested in getting involved in these calls. So. Um, but uh, I got interested in NaNoWriMo because I started, um, it was my first time teaching a year-long creative writing class. I'd done uh, semester-long classes before. And uh, I wanted to give the students some choice in what we did. And so I, I asked the students for ideas about things that they would enjoy doing. And um, they had a lot of different ideas, but the one that really caught my eye was NaNoWriMo. A student uh, said they had participated in NaNoWriMo before and, and uh, thought it would be interesting for us. Um, and then as I explored it more, I saw that um, it might be a good way to have students uh, be able to work together um, and come up with a story in common. Um, and so that's how I kind of approached it. I wanted them to uh, develop it on their own. And so by doing um, these interconnected stories, they were able to really, through class discussions, kind of come up with how the different characters were going to interrelate and what was going to happen in the story. And so I really just, I liked that I was able to really give the students a lot of control and let them just run with it and see uh, what they could come up with. And uh, I, I did it with two different classes and, and I found that uh, you have to have a certain number of students that are um, you know, actively participating to make it work, but if you've got that, it can really go well. Karen, do you want to talk? I, I've never tried this, so I, I'm like uh, just sitting here in awe that you guys uh, have done this much writing. Um, what's it like? I mean, it must take discipline. There's, um, I know there, I, when I look at the site, I see there are calendars and people encouraging each other and so forth. What's it like? To, do you, you try to write a certain number of words each day kind of thing, or how does it work? I think everybody does it a different way, but I mean, I would say anybody in the world can do this and even like no matter how busy you are it, it's just I, I think it's really doable and I would um I would really recommend Chris Beatty's book um, No Plot No Problem because he gives a lot of tips about sort of 
what makes this work. But I, w I wish I hope Harry gets back on. But Harry wrote a blog post that was really good about this. And one of the things he said is it almost works better. And a lot of people have said it almost works better if you're really busy. There you go, Sherry. <laughs> um, because you just you know you just jump in and do it. And it I think the idea of just writing and not planning and like just having a flow and just see where it goes. Um, you know, Chris talks a lot about just write and it doesn't, you know, don't edit, don't don't plan or think, just churn out and really focus on word count because that's kind of the whole thing of this is just get get to that word count. And then like I said, so different what, people what is do the it. word count per day that you're aiming for? Is it a daily well, or is it a yeah. It's 50,000. I mean, what, what NaNoWriMo considers, at least for the regular adult program, and I think the youth mm -hmm. program is a little bit different, but 50,000 words is what they define as a novel. So they, so you're sort of declared a winner if you write 50,000 words between November 1st and the end of November. Um, and there's not, you know, it doesn't have to be a complete novel, but that's sort of their... <laughs> determination. And I think in the student program a lot of schools um, set their own word counts or have their students set their word counts which I think makes a lot of sense. So I mean how I go about it is I do have a word count goal per day but then I also give myself like some days off. Um, and I've all, I usually finish really early but I just I don't you know I think like I said everybody does it in a different way but it's great and I really and Anybody who's just thinking about doing it, I would say jump in and do it. You totally can. And it seems the first year I did it, I just thought I would never be able to do it. And I mean, I don't want to say it wasn't hard because there's definitely days where you're like, I can never finish this thing. But anybody can do it. Um, Brad actually did it last year, and he is completely. Um, that's my partner. He's actually he's like not a writer at all. He he, he just doesn't write, and he I don't know what made him decide. It was the third year I'd done it. Not he last didn't, year, but he didn't do it in code or anything, right? He no, he actually wrote like a story. I could hardly believe it. And yeah. he did great, I mean, and he really liked it. I th I'm pretty sure he's going to do it again this year, too. So we both took off last year because we were in the last stages of the house, and we just couldn't do it. But, but it's, it's very doable, and it's incredibly um, rewarding and enriching, and I would encourage anybody to do it. So, Sherry and Tommy, how do you guys deal with your students and word counts and deadlines and things like that? Okay. In writers, NaNoWriMo, the students mm -hmm. can set their own goals. So, like, we do power writing. So they pretty much know how much they can write in a 10-minute period and figure out how much wait, they wait, can write in a that? day. Right. So you power write and they count their words and then they know what... So. Yeah, we do. Uh, it's based on Peter Elbow's work. Mm -hmm. And so they just choose any topic and they have a sheet of paper that has a bunch of words on it and they have to, we start out with five minutes and we can build up to 15 minutes in the eighth grade and I just tell them, ready, set, write, and they have to keep write, their pencil move writing for that entire time. And if they, if they draw a blank, they just repeat the last word they wrote over and over until another idea comes up. Right. And then after the time right. limit, they count up their words. Yeah. And we do that three times when we do and that. And that, that, that helps them figure out how many words they can produce? Or? Yeah. That tells them how or many that's words just, they yeah. can write. Yeah. It, it's just a guide for them that they know. And then they figure out, we figure out how many days in the month we have class because we actually do this during class time. Mm -hmm. But they can do it anytime they want to. They can, and we use Google Docs, so we actually are typing it up. And um, so they figure out how many words they have to do each day, which is kind of what I do. But I, I put a lot of the load on the front end because I'm always afraid I'm never going to make it. So, <laughs> and it's Thanksgiving at the end, so. I've got to be done. Yeah, so you want to be done before then, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tommy, uh, the, another question has come up in the chat room, which is, uh, do, do students ever have disagreements about the way the story should go when they're doing it collaboratively? Yeah. Um, let me answer the first question there, and then yeah, I'll come back to the question yeah. from the chat. Um, mm -hmm. My students don't really have uh, too many problems uh, getting the 3,000 words uh, because... 
because you know we have enough students that they only really need to write 3,000 or 3,500 each. Um, the only time we got close was at the very end of the project. I think it was about two days before uh, Thanksgiving. Um, one of the students, and this kind of ties into the question from the uh, chat there also, one of the students was kind of uh, uh, pulling the class energy down a little bit and you know they were having a discussion about uh, making the stories uh, line up, having the details be the same in each story and uh, so some students were talking about that and this one student was kind of going, hey you know what does it matter? I mean that we're just you know this is just NaNoWriMo or, and you know it's no big deal and it's kind of pulling the energy down and I looked at how many words we had at that point and we were at about 42,000 and we were trying to get the 50,000 um, and we had been they'd been writing it individually on Google Docs and then I had been combining them into one uh, big document to get the word count on it and uh, so I kind of explained to them, well, we're at 42,000 and, uh, you know, so if we're going to do it, we need to get 8,000 more words. And then we met the next class and that was the last class before uh, Thanksgiving break. So we had to get it done. And uh, when they walked in, I kind of said, hey, you know, this is where we're at. We've got 42,000 and, uh, you know, I mean, there are several options. We could just, you know, give up and say we didn't make it or we could um, – you know, try to work on the stories you've been working on and get them, uh, you know, bulked up a little bit to get to the 50,000. Um, or we could, uh, you know, write, add some different stories in because, you know, we've got, you know, each of us did one character, but there's no reason some of us couldn't do a couple of characters. Because I had some really strong writers, you know, one, one girl had completely finished her part the first day, you know, that we walked into the class. And then other students, you know, on the last day, they're, they're like 300 words or something. Um, and so you get a wide range of, it's not really writing abilities, it's more about um, just, you know, whether they want to participate or not as seniors and in their, you know, fourth credit uh, English class that they, they just have to do to graduate. Um, and uh, I kind of put one idea up on the board that I was, that I thought would make an interesting story. And the students really came through. Um, and this is where it really matters that you have uh, enough students to kind of get this energy. Um, because as soon as I put that idea up, the, the students that were really into it had other ideas that they'd been thinking about and they kind of started shouting them out and I wrote them on the board and um, the reason I know that the that the, it really was a community project and that it worked was um, the idea that I had was uh, for somebody to write from Dan Lobato's um, point of view and Dan Lobato is a maintenance man at the school and he's a great guy you know I used to talk to him every night after school and, and I'd been telling him about the project because as the students were getting into it um, and he was really interested in it and I, and I just knew that he would love to be in it and so I wanted somebody to write from his perspective and uh, the kid who had been saying oh you know what does it matter if all the details line up he volunteered to write Dan Lobato Auto story. So I knew at that point that it was that it was something that was pulling the students together and making them um, really get into it. Um, now let me go on to the uh, question from the chat. Uh, do the students ever have disagreements about the way the story should go? Um, and and, or, and also, or just how does it go? Like how do they work together? And you know, what's yeah. the sort of process look like? Yeah. Yeah, what I did at the beginning was I kind of had been, in the last couple of weeks of October, I had been giving them some ideas about how we could approach this. I hadn't really talked about NaNoWriMo yet, but I had been reading um, chapters from um, David Levithon's book. Uh, it's called The Realm of Possibility. And that's one of these books where every chapter is in a different voice. And that one I thought was you know, well suited for my students because each chapter is a uh, a student at a high school, and so there are, all the stories are completely different. You know, there's there there's not really a plot that runs through the all the stories, but all of the stories are interlinked. And as you read the book, you start to see that oh, that character that they were talking about in that chapter is this character here, and so you start to see how the connections are made between all these characters, um, even though each chapter is completely different. And and if you read one chapter on its own, you you wouldn't need any other chapter to make it make sense. Um, and then we also um, watched when we finished the last project. I kind of introduced NaNoWriMo and said I was thinking about doing it this way. And then we watched this movie uh, called uh, Valentine's Day, which is a 
um, it worked out well because it's it's a modern movie, so the character, the actors in it are relevant for students, um, and it also has this um, overlapping stories concept going on, um, and it was also it was kind of old enough that most of my students hadn't seen it. Um, so, you know, they enjoyed watching it and they could see how overlapping stories can, can work in that way. Um, so I'd given them some context to understand how we could have the stories overlap. Um, and then in the beginning of the month or maybe just right before November began, I kind of introduced the idea of NaNoWriMo and they were all into it. They wanted to do it. They thought it was an interesting idea. They liked the idea of uh, being in a contest that wasn't related to the school. You know, if you if you succeed, you've you know reached a real challenge. It's not something that your teacher sets up for you. So they liked that. Um, and they also see. I didn't know that other students had been doing it. So I kind of introduced it as like, oh, we'll be the first ones doing this, and you know maybe we're breaking the rules. And you know they kind of like that. It, it helps to engage a little bit mm -hmm. if they're there's some risk involved. Um, and so they really wanted to do it. And so I, I kind of said, well, uh, you know, for next class, come in with an idea that all of the stories could be connected. And I kind of approached it in location ways uh, because I think a lot of people, when they're writing, um, they tend to emphasize the plot. And I think that in these overlapping stories and also with just the way NaNoWriMo works, a lot of the connection can be location. And uh, so I tried to introduce the idea that it needs to be a location that all of the characters are familiar with. And uh, so they they went off and I, and I said, come up with an idea and then also, you know, have an idea of how many main characters we'll need because there'll be a lot of side characters. But, you know, if we need to have several characters. We need to know exactly what you need. And so the next class, everybody came in and they had their ideas. I made them write, you know, 500 words about it. And uh, we just had a class discussion and I wrote all the ideas on the board as they were uh, listing them off and describing what their ideas were. And the ideas were really, you know, wide sci-fi and romance and et cetera, et cetera. And um, they just voted on the one that they thought was the most interesting. And there was a lot of discussion that day too about whether it would work or not. You know, it's, uh, there, was, there was a crew that was really pulling for sci-fi and other students were saying, no, it's, you know, it's not going to be believable and can't do it and whatever. And the one that they decided on that they thought would work the best, and virtually all of them wanted it to be set at the high school because you know, that's, as a person going to high school, it's hard to imagine a location other than that that people would be familiar with, um, that, you know, that all the students would be familiar with. Um, so they they pretty much were all in the high school, and the one that they voted on was to have a school shooting, um, which, you know, for me, that was a little bit scary because I didn't want to have a whole class uh, working on a school shooting, and, you know, that could be big problems. And so I kind of had a discussion with them then and, and just said, you know, as seniors, I want you to, you know, be engaged in the project and work on something you're interested in, but, you know, it can't be violent or, uh, you know, explicit in any way or, or really, you know, nothing that can get me fired. <laughs> and they could do that. And, uh, and, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't really think anything bad would come of it or anything, so I said that was fine with me. And um, they kind of just discussed that day, um, you know, how to make it work, um, what characters were going to be necessary. Um, and then it kind of took off from there, and we spent another, I think it was at least two days total, it might have even been a little bit more than that, just kind of elaborating how the characters were going to fit into it, and what characters people were going to be writing about and, um, you know, just getting kind of a general idea of where the, the, uh, the book would go. And a lot of it was really created on that day. That was kind of, um, you know, Sherry was talking about how it's really just letting your imagination go and not being too worried if the plot, you know, if there is a plot even. Um, and what happened was students would say things like, well, you know, I think um, that's real interesting uh, to have, you know, this girl be the shooter. And that was the idea that the person came in with, that it was going to be a school shooting and it was going to be a girl that was the shooter. And that was the, I think that was what everybody got hooked in because everybody, when she first was talking about it, was thinking it would be a guy. Um, and 
you know, then people were saying, well, um, you know, she got upset um, about there was a rape earlier, and what really made her upset was nobody believed her when she came out and said that she had been raped. And so then people started to kind of explore that idea, and somebody said, well, I want to be um, the rapist. You know, I want to write from that character's point of view because maybe he didn't even really know that that, that was, you know, that that was how it played out. Maybe he didn't I, see I, it that way. You're scaring people away, but keep going. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I know. When the, when the conversation it's, it's was going, I was scared. You open it up to kids. This is what happens. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing with literature. You know, I read a ton of YA literature, and um, this is the stuff that kids think about. And it's not, um, uh, you know, they know how to handle it um, to make it fit and as they were writing it I was really cautious about things you know when I when this person said they wanted to be that character I thought oh man how are they ever gonna be able to make that work but they actually did it really well he ended up being um, a friend of the brother and it was kind of a, a uh, you know he it played out in a way that made sense and it wasn't um, really you know drastic or anything um, and but what I liked about it was that on that day, all of the story was built out. Um, so people started to uh, add stories and say, well, I want to be the, the, uh, the girl who did the shooting. I want to be her father, and uh, you know, I'll, maybe I'll be a policeman, and I was teaching her to shoot. You know, years before, um, and I never realized on that day, you know, that it would lead to this. And so, um, you know, all these different aspects of the story kind of came out just through the class discussing these things. And you know, it sounds kind of scary, but then the story, when it came came together, it was really pretty pretty neat and well developed. Um, and so. I think that you have to be prepared um, if you let students take over and, and really control the story. You have to know how far you're going to uh, be able to handle it and, and you know, what you're going to permit. Um, and you, know, you have to be prepared as you're reading things as well to say, hey, you know, I can't really uh, put this in a community project and have it on a document that everybody's seeing and, and uh, you know, edit it um, if you need to. In, in a more when when kids are working on individual projects, Sherry, do do you run into those issues as well, or like what's appropriate, what's not, or how do you uh, handle? Or, well, we just talk about it, and they pretty much know what's appropriate and what's inappropriate, and they will usually talk some inappropriate plots, but then come around. They know they're they're pretty savvy. They know what works, but that doesn't mean that they don't write some. Uh, deeper issues like one of my students this year is writing about she has friends but she's not really close to them so her goal is to build a better bond with her friends so um, you know she's already you know that's a pretty deep concept for a she's an eighth grader to try to you know mm -hmm. build that up so and she's you know got it all outlined so and then some of the kids like they're dirt bikers, so they want to be pro dirt bikers, and they set up the scenario. And we got one kid's in rodeo, and he doesn't want to disappoint his family by, and I don't even know the terms he's using because <laughs> I know nothing about rodeos. But you know, he says I can't do this, and I'm afraid I'm going to, and my family will be disappointed. So, <laughs> so they are all coming up with what's close to them because you know the first thing I said was writers have to write about what they know so find something that that you know about or can ask someone about so a couple years ago there was a Navy SEAL story because there was an uncle who was a Navy SEAL and so he interviewed him so that he could put you know the real vocabulary and something that might really happen so it's pretty exciting because they find something that they're interested in and you go and most of the time you're thinking I didn't know you were interested in this and that's what I'm you know both um, what we're just saying is that it's so freeing and yet it meets all the standards what they're doing meets the yeah, standards. Go ahead and say more about that I mean because you've talked on the show before about how 
you at times at your school feel pressured to do things or not do things because of different standards. You're saying this meets all the standards? Well, sure. The, on the uh, Young Writers, um, Nano Writers uh, site, they have the, their curriculum all lined lessons and everything that with the Common Core State Standards. And those, um, Harry even mentioned they even have a rubric and everything. So mm -hmm. I'm sorry, you know, Karen, do you think yeah. he's going to join us or has he given up or no? Nah, doesn't look like it. I'm not sure. I haven't heard, but I know his bandwidth was bad. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well. Yeah. yeah organizing. And yeah, organizing and developing your topic and putting in your details and using your dialogue and I mean everything's in there. So. I mean, that's what real writers do anyway, so that's what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. Cool. Oh. I wanted to uh, say I saw that, uh, yeah, I saw that people in the chat are still um, interested in how the kind of process brought it together. Um, and so I wanted to encourage people, I wrote about it on Digital Is, um, and so you know, if you want, if you go to the Digital Is site and put in NaNoWriMo, my project will come up there um, because it got really interesting. Sure as well, too, by the way, when you put that in. But go ahead, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it got really interesting on um, when we got into the editing phase uh, because that was when students started to look at the other students' stories and to see what you know people that were writing about the same event had to say about it and. Uh, what they found was that there was a lot of really beautiful ideas that they hadn't really considered or even thought about. And it was interesting to see how the other characters were approaching the situation because some of them were writing about it from after the event, the event reflecting on it. Um, some of them were writing about it, you know, sort of the events that led up to the main event. And um, so they were really interested to see uh, what aspects were coming out. And like Sherry was talking about, students were writing, you know, from their own point of view. I had a student in the class who was uh, getting ready to join the uh, I think he was going into the Air Force, either the Air Force or the Marines. And so he he kind of wrote about it, you know, as a student that, you know, was kind of used to um, thinking about tactical situations and he was outside the building when the event started. And, and but he, he had that aspect to it too, but he also had a real, um, you know, he was a real family man. You know, he thought about uh, friends and family. And so his character in the story was the same way and kind of uh, was very sensitive about, you know, what was happening to other people. It was really beautiful the way he'd written. Um, and so when they went into it, um, there was this uh, movement uh, to have um, not only to help people edit, to make their language clearer and clear up some grammar aspects. Um, so what I did was on the Google document that had all of the stories, you know, when people would finish, they would say, okay, you can put it on the document. And I would put it in there. Um, and that document people could comment on. And, uh, you know, I was surprised one time we went to open it up and it froze because there were so many comments on it. Students had been going in, you know, after after hours, you know, because I wasn't really requiring them to write on it outside of the class or anything, but they were going in, you know, over the weekend and, and reading other people's stories and they were, um, you know, I had kind of talked to them about, you know, how to, Youth Voices is really good about how to do comments and, you know, how to be respectful and, and uh, to help encourage stu other students and how to make their story better. And so my students were really making positive comments on it. Um, but then after they started doing that, editing other people and kind of going through and seeing what people had written, um, characters started to show up in each other's stories, you know, because I also said, hey, if you're if you're stuck, you know, if you're only at, you know, a thousand words or something and, and you need a new direction, go in and read some of these other stories and see what the other students around the school um, or, you know, some of them are writing from librarians or teachers' points of views or neighbors. Oh. How would they decide once once they submitted their ver their chapter to yep. to the common one? How would they decide where to edit then? Would they edit right there when they added other things, or would they go back to their own? And 
Well, I didn't originally. That's a good question because Google Docs allows you to do a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, and the choice that I made was to make the document uh, view only, but you could make comments on it. Okay. So they would go in and say, oh, you know, I really like where you're going with this character. Maybe you could add, you know, something about what they were thinking about this. Um, so it was just comments along the side of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then they would go back and they would re-edit their own document. And then, you know, after they worked on it for a while, they'd resubmit it to me. And they, well, basically, they would just tell me, oh, I, I re-edited it. Why don't you put the new version in the in the kind of the rough draft that we have for everybody. Um, and so this this went on for quite a while, and this went on basically until the end of November when we, you know, got the 50,000 words. Um, and then I had some students that liked it so well, um, and, you know, they really thought it was good. Um, they went on to continue to edit it, um, even into the new year. And um, in the new year, I asked them, you know, do you think this is good enough to get published as a YA literature book and um, and they were you know they didn't know if it would get published or not but they wanted to give it a shot so they actually submitted it to uh, several different agents um, I got uh, I've gotten a couple of uh, you know no thank you letters from uh, different agents that they've received and forward on to me. Um, so I don't know if they're still working on it, but uh, they definitely were way more engaged in this project than I've ever seen students get on any other project. And, and you know, I don't know exactly why it happened, but I think there was partly that, that community aspect that they were connected and how they were working on it. And then also um, just that they had free range. You know, they were, I let them do what they were really interested in and what they found to be a real interesting story, which that's what I like about NaNoWriMo. You know, they, they can just do whatever they want. You know, there's no, uh, you know, there's no set. You don't have to write any specific story. You can do whatever seems good. Sherry, um, what about your students and um, how they shared with each other uh, during the process? That's one thing. And what, any other kind of outside audience? curious but then when it gets to publishing what's that look like um, <clears throat> during the project sometimes they'll just sit together by the screen but most of them will choose a buddy that they share their document with and then they'll do what um, Tommy said they'll write comments on the side about what they think and you know any suggestions that they have and then we have days where, where they just share their best parts and then share a part that they're confused with to the class and we'll talk about it. Um, and they can work on it at any time. They don't have to just work on it in class. Then in, we usually uh, share them in December. I'll print out like the first 10 pages of each of the stories and we'll just they'll just present them and we'll we'll just shift them around the room and and read each other's work and mm -hmm. and talk about it and then in January is when we do our editing and if they if they want to finish so it, it's kind of up to the author mm -hmm. and they haven't actually published um, the first year the kids all published their books from I can't remember who it was but the other kids you mean it was really self-publishing? Yeah, self-publishing it, yeah. yeah. And so, so that's always an option. I always help the kids do that if they want to do that. But most of them just wanted to keep it on Google Docs, and some of them would put chapters on their blogs, you know. So mm -hmm. that's pretty much what they do. But it's, mm -hmm. it's very exciting for them because they'll just, you know, when they come into class, they run to the computers and... They start typing, and then one of them will say, "Listen, listen." <laughs> Their friend, they'll happen and they'll talk about it, and they'll laugh, or they'll get serious or say, "I think he'd say this," you know. So <laughs> it's it's really, you know, like Tommy said, so engaging for the students. So it sounds like, it sounds like go ahead, but it sounds like there was a lot of peer. I mean, most of the motivation came from peers. Yes, which is is you know is what we want, right? Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. And, you know, I really liked his his idea of doing that collaborative book. Mm. And when I read his blog, I wondered if I should do that. But my kids all come from such, you know, they're 
middle schoolers and they have their little personas and individual <laughs> likes. So I thought, oh, I'm just going to keep it this way, but I might talk about that idea next year. Because I really I see the power in having some incident or some event and then they write the pass-throughs of before and after. I think that's pretty exciting. Karen, it, it was a no, it was a good. Go ahead, Tommy. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, hearing Sherry talk about, you know, she's kind of thinking about having students do it. Um, I think with younger students, it might be. I think if you just give them the context so that they can kind of see how those stories can interrelate, um, that that will help a lot. Um, and then. You know, I, they really enjoyed it, um, and I think it was even for my students that normally didn't participate at all. They got into it and they wrote stuff for it, and so I think just seeing that you are part of a bigger thing and seeing that you are part of a story that many people are working on can be uh, can be engaging for students. So mm -hmm. um, give it a try. You know, if it doesn't work, uh, it doesn't work, but at least give it a try, just because. I was so impressed with how engaged they got into it. Tell Even me, my class, I, like I said, I... I was going to ask, go I, I know you did, you did uh, movies and media stuff with, was it with the same students? Um, did they, because that's a collaborative kind of storytelling too. That is. I know I did that with my media studies class. Um, okay. I actually yeah. I was gonna do it with my creative writing class, but we they had done a similar project in their drama class, so they didn't want to. They were like, ah, we've already done movies. Um, but I have done that with my media studies, and and they do get into it. The same same thing there. When students are working on a story together, they uh, for some reason that pulls them in more than when they're working on on you know on their own. Um, so it's uh, it's definitely a technique to try. Yeah. Karen, you were wanting to say something earlier, or or now doesn't matter. Um, no, but okay. I, just on the subject of self-publishing, I know that um, Nana Rimo has a really nice option at the end where they have a partnership with somebody where you can really inexpensively get books printed, and if you want, you can even self-publish them and sell them through Amazon. It's really easy. But I think that like having a book that you wrote is really, yeah, I mean, for cool. me as an adult, it's like really cool. Yeah. You know, I'm, I mean, I, I, I'm thinking that a student came to me today who's been kind of, well, she's been disengaged. Um, and uh, she said, I'm going to write a play. And uh, leave me alone. I don't want to do any of your assignments anymore. So, you know, I'm like, so there, there's something about this that kind of gets the teacher out of the center, um, and you know, the assignments out of the center, and so that's really interesting. I think. Yeah, that's great. I think Nano also has a script writing project some month, not November. I don't know hmm. if anybody's done that, but that's another hmm. one. There's so something about it being like in a month. I mean, I would say that that's a really both of, both of our our friends here. It sounds like it bleeds into January too. But yes, yeah. go ahead. But there's go something ahead. really motivating about like you start on Jan on November first, and there's a deadline, and it's like 30 days. And I think, I mean, for writers, whether they're adults or or youth, that's it's, it's contained. Yeah. Uh -huh. But it's also to me, it's like super motivating. And then I think. I mean, I can, I can certainly, I'm hearing, you know, students keep writing and they keep working on it, which is great, but I think that's a really nice approach. Mm -hmm. So, um, we have, uh, you know, 10 minutes left to talk about K-12. Uh, can, here's, here's what I'd love to know, because it looks like a lot of work you guys do. Can you identify the other committee members and tell some of the background, tell some of the backstory, and, I mean... Is that is that fair to do? Um, yeah. Yeah, because I'm probably not the best person to do this. Deserve, <laughs> well, that's okay. You're here. <laughs> yeah. but, well, Peggy Peggy George is in the chat room and watching, yeah. and so big shout out to her because she's mm -hmm. been with this for a lot of years. Um, it was started in um, it was started by Wes Fryer, and I believe I want to say this is the tenth year, but. Um, 
Peggy's going to chime in and chat and let me know. Um, but it is, um, it's too. definitely, a link there, yeah, she, <laughs> um, okay. it's a big team effort. So um, Westfriar and Peggy, and then there are four strand conveners um, who this year, it's Jose Rodriguez who's been on our show, so we know him. Mm -hmm. um, Susan Van Gelder from Canada, who's fabulous. Um, myself and Paula Noggle, who's new to it this year. And then we also have um, one additional um, committee member this year who's Kim Thomas who's helping with marketing and various other things. So when and did you start? When did you guys start meeting and thinking about this? And um, you, you should see the Google Doc of our meeting notes. <laughs> it's like long and long and we meet um, for about the first, I don't know, for like maybe two months before the conference or mm -hmm. I guess sometime before when the call for proposals comes out we start meeting weekly. Um, and I also have to say, like, the probably the most important volunteers in this whole thing are our speakers. And everybody does this just sort of on their own time. And Sherry's been on, and Sherry's in. Sherry, you're in a couple sessions, like in little cameo roles this year. Is that right? Am I? <laughs> I know I I've seen you at least once or twice. <laughs> okay. Um, but really. It takes a lot of time to do a session, and actually, my first involvement um, with K-12 Online in any formal way was doing a session, um, which Paul helped me with. Um, but it's it's a lot of work to put that together, so we really appreciate. You get a keynote, right? Can you? There there are keynotes, and then there are other sessions. And, That's right. But is everything 15 to 20 minutes, or? Yeah, everything's supposed to be 20 minutes, and keynotes are allowed to go a little bit longer. And, but we, we kind of don't want sessions to be less than about 15 minutes because that's kind of what people expect. And mm -hmm. it seems like a good chunk for people to use for formal professional development as well. Okay. People all over the world watch it and just people use it in pre-service and formal and informal. And, you know, we encourage people to have discussions about the things. And there's... I, there's we post them all on the blog on it's at k12 online conference dot of discussion on Twitter like you know everything else the connected stuff Twitter seems to be increasingly where a lot of these conversations are happening which is really interesting because it's kind of random but I mean you can really have deep conversations on Twitter I think <laughs> you can yeah I believe that. <laughs> No, you can. Um, <laughs> I've been in some with Karen. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's, and I mean, it takes a long time. So this is kind of the whole Connected Educator Month topic. But I, I would say when I first got on Twitter, I didn't, I thought, you know, like a lot of people, I didn't get it. And, and now I feel like I have really good friends and we have really big conversations. And sometimes you jump off of Twitter and like, you know, we always say Twitter is like the greatest um, writing prompt generator of all time because so many people blog based on sort of conversations we start on Twitter which I think that's really cool. Yeah. Um, I, ha, however, the, the K-12 online conference is a different medium, right? I mean, what's... having put one together, it, it was hard for me and what I really strive to do was, you know, not try to do everything and try to yeah. focus in some way and, and so that there's some message in the end, um, but but yeah, you know, I mean, and it's not a conversation. It's not like this, it's like that we're going down. It's not Twitter. It's like right. a, it is a presentation. So I don't know. I mean, it just takes a little different kind of um, head space for the presenters to think. It is different, it. and it takes. Um, and I will I will say I've since I've got. A preview of your session. It's great and everybody should watch it. Um, it comes out, I had the schedule up and I closed it, but it comes up next week. Um, but it does take, um, I'm going to recap some of the stuff Peggy's saying in the chat and one of them is it takes a lot of time to put together one of these. It does, I think, and people, am I here? Yep, you're people, um, yeah, people people approach it different ways. So some people, 
I mean, we've had like Steve Hargan and Audrey Waters last year. They got on a Google Hangout, and I'm sure they'd sort of practiced and prepped it, but they basically just recorded a 20-minute sort of structured conversation that they had as a Hangout. Mm -hmm. um, other people bring in a lot of outside clips. A lot of people this year have brought have had um, past speakers and and other people in their networks do like little, you know a minute on something and then sort of put those all together. We have a lot of student voices which we always encourage people to bring to bring their students into this and we've had um, sessions that were just done by students before. So it's kind of, I mean the constraints on the presentation are 20 minutes, you know it's a, it's a asynchronous video so you have to, the presenters have to send us a 20 minute, one 20 minute video file but other than that they can approach it sort of however they want. And we it's fun to see all the creative ways that people do it. And Peggy says that um, the conference started in 2006. Um, and the asynchronous piece of it is really a big deal. And it's also on iTunes U. And that is big thanks to Peggy. She does all the work of getting the videos up onto iTunes U so that people can access it there as well. Mm -hmm. So. As you were talking um, about how it's used in other professional development sessions and so forth later on, not not necessarily during during these two weeks, how does how does anybody know about that? Do you know? I mean, well, I guess we can get it's available. hear about it, but yeah, what? Yeah, how do they know it's available? No, no, no. How do you know how it's used? Oh uh, well, we don't always. I mean, this is kind of like the MOOC thing where we hear. Yeah. You know, sometimes six months later, we'll get an email or see a tweet or somebody will post and say, oh, we had 200 people <laughs> view this at whatever, and this is what we do. And it's like, that's amazing. And I think, I always think, for every one of those that we hear, there's probably 100 we don't hear. And mm -hmm. that's just, I only have to hear about two of those, and I'm like, this makes it all worthwhile because I know mm -hmm. so many people out there are using it. Um, Peggy also... And the, go ahead. And okay, the back to you. The archives are available too for all the past years. Years and years, yeah. So, yeah. And some of that's, you know, still very relevant. So definitely. We do have some information on the website about how people can go about if they're interested in getting some kind of formal professional um, development credit for this, um, sort of how they might go about that. And we don't we don't really you know, we don't issue graduate credits or anything, but there's you know, there are ways people can go about that. And sometimes we hear from people on that where they'll let us know that they're, they've are they done something to get formal credit for it. And I think that's really exciting. I don't know if everybody saw this, but for Connected Educator Month this year, they have a university who's giving grad credits for participation in Connected Educator Month. And I think, you know, we've all, all of us who work in these informal spaces have all talked about, you know, how do you, how do you get formal credit? Because that's so important, but also how do you do it and not compromise the the integrity of what's good about informal learning that doesn't always map to what people want when you do credit. And I applaud them for getting that done and making that an option. And I think once there are models like that, then more people will do things like that, which is great. So the two places to look for that is, is at connecteducators.com. Org, is it? I think it is. I believe that's correct. Yep. And um, and at uh, K twelve online conference. Right. Dot org. Org. Dot org. Yeah. 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 Um. So both places show you how to get credit. Is that right? Um. Yes. In in Connected Educator Month, there's a more formal opportunity. In K twelve online, there's sort of guidelines, and people can certainly email us too for suggestions. But we're not actually issuing credit through K twelve online. So we uh, should um, go around and hear kind of last thoughts. One of, one of the things I wanted to ask right before that, or maybe this is my last thought, is that when I hear 2006, that's like when this show started too. And so I'm starting to wonder, and when I look at the other presenters, um, I'm like, are there young people coming out of college these days um, participating in this stuff too? <laughs> How, to what degree is 2006, how, to what degree is some of this work generational? I'm just wondering. I don't know. But, yeah. I mean, because okay, obviously, um, I don't know if it's obvious. Let me ask. The conveners reached out to people you knew, right? And so how do we keep this going, opening up to more and more people? 
Right. Well, I, I think writing no project does. Yeah. Writing Project does an amazing job of that, and I mean, I would say at the at the summer writing institute that I went to, I felt really old. I was really happy there was somebody who was older than me. I mean, it was really college kids, and which is which is great. Um, but I think you know, I think that's a strength, and yeah. but it's a valid thing to think about and yeah. keep pushing on. Yep. So uh, that that's just where my head was right now. I, I, Tommy, why don't you? kind of give some wrap up or what what you'd like to end here with for us. Uh, well I just uh I you know I'm gonna participate in NanoRimo this year and I hope to uh, personally you are? Personally yeah and I hope to get more students into it uh, as soon as possible. So, seems yeah. like a good project and I hope other people uh, give it a shot and, and uh you know if you're willing to uh uh let students take control, they can turn out some really neat things and get really engaged. So I encourage everybody to give it a shot at least. Cool. Thanks for sharing with us tonight. Share. Any thoughts? Yeah, I, I think anybody should try it. And if you're in middle school, just use the curriculum. That'll get you started, get your ideas. And once you try it, you'll, and your students will just feel that freedom of imagining a story and making it come alive. Something that didn't exist before now exists. It's yeah, awesome. which, which I didn't mention it before, but as you and Tommy were talking, you know, it totally connects with the maker stuff, right? And the, mm -hmm. the, the, the totally. that you're all connected with. And Carrie, do you get any last thoughts, or does Peggy have any last thoughts? <laughs> Since you're channeling her. Uh, <laughs> um, again, you know, thanks to everybody who does this stuff and who talks about it because it supports all of us and I would just echo what Sherry said you know if you have ever thought about writing a novel or if you have any interest try it I think it's you know it seems daunting but it is just a delightful treat to yourself to do in November yeah and you yeah. know I was thinking as you guys were talking how um, you know, we're always concerned about social issues and doing research and all that kind of stuff, but I'm sure that comes up in novels too, like real important deep issues comes up um, as kids are doing this stuff too. So, yeah, just to say. Um, <laughs> well, even, even um, not scientific issues, because last year one of my kids uh, wanted to do, he's a snowboarder, and so he did research on what if I got, you know, hurt in the snow, what would I have to do? What do I have to know? So that's what he did research on, and that's what he built his story around. Comes, you know, so. yeah, yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, lots to think about, guys. Thank you um, I, again. Um, we've been here again since about 2006 um, as well um, with um, uh, the uh, site that started at, at edtechtalk.com. Um, which is a channel of the World Bridges Network that Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier set up. And um, thank you all for participating here tonight, and we'll see you in lots of different spaces. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Paul. Good to talk with you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.